from WJCT Studios in Jacksonville, Florida, I'm Ray Hollister. I'm Tom Braun. And this is Deemable Tech, tech help worth listening to. This week's episode of the Deemable Tech Podcast is brought to you by A Small Orange Homegrown Hosting, a refreshingly different approach to web hosting on the web at asmallorange.com. And by audible.com. Deemable Tech listeners can get a free audiobook download at audibletrial.com slash deemable. Over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And from All Florida Insurance Options, an authorized progressive agency. Helping people shop for insurance at 904-757-3288 or at their office in Highland Square on Dunn Avenue in North Jacksonville. Hey, got a question about your computer, smartphone, tablet, or the internet, or any other electronic gadget? <laughs> Give us a call at 1-888-972-9868 or send us an email at questions at dmble.com. And we will answer it. Today on DMOL Tech, we're answering questions about how to throw away your computer and whether or not you can trust LastPass and how Nextdoor.com can make your neighborhood better. All right, let's answer. We got a question here. Let me read it real quick. Okay. Uh, it says, hi, Ray and Tom. I'm recruiting for a company that needs a computer programmer slash coder okay. that could move into a managerial role at this company. It's a property management company voted one of the most fun places to work in Jacksonville. Mm. Uh, Benefits day one include free lunch every day. What? Seriously? I think I want to apply. Me too. That right there. Free Free gym membership. Okay, that's cool. Health, dental, PTO. What's PTO? Pay time off. Pay time off. Or possibly poor transport overload. (laughs) (laughs) Overlords? Overlords, yes. I'm going to go with pay time off. That probably makes more sense. Young, fun, Google-type environment. If you guys have any friends looking for a job or a change of environment and have at least two years of coding programming, please let me know. Thank you so much and hope you're doing well, Ray. Haven't seen you since high school. Oh, hey, this is my friend Katie from high school. Okay, cool. That's not really a question. That's not really a tech question. Um, but, but you know her. And yeah, I do know her. Uh, Katie's awesome. And um, yeah, so if you're listening to the show and you got two years of coding or programming experience and you're looking for a job or a new job, uh, call us and we'll f- get you her information. She's I guess. a recruiter. Yep. I field uh, one of those a week, which I know sounds like, oh my gosh, Tom, you're turning out a job a week. But oh, like, seriously, like once you are sort of like so cool. in the industry, like recruiters are like, ah, get away from me. Get off, get off. I mean, you're like that to recruiters. Yes. Get off of me. Sorry. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't hit think. Your mic. <laughs> sorry. Hit my mic. Um, yeah. I think recruiters are like, come on, please. Yeah. I mean, they just like randomly will call you. And well, that's I, cool. I've taken my resume off like every online service. They find you through LinkedIn now. That's how they yeah. do it. Uh, They're like, hey, how you doing? How's how's that job going? Good. Still there. Gonna stay. You, you know, while we're talking about LinkedIn, have you been getting requests from people you don't know on LinkedIn? I have. Very occasionally. Very occasionally. I have. And, Not like a lot. And I thought it might be because of the show, yeah. uh, Doom Will Tech, because um, it's people I have no idea who these people are. Hmm. And um, no offense if you're listening. Um, I'm not going to friend you on LinkedIn. Yeah. I- I'll follow you on Twitter. I might follow I you on Facebook. But LinkedIn, I, I don't know. It's just that's wait, wait. special. You're <laughs> What? <laughs> LinkedIn, LinkedIn is, is your sacred social That's network. That's my sacred place. No, more than Facebook well, or Twitter, LinkedIn has to be protected. Well, Facebook. No, I, I guess it's just because LinkedIn implies I know you. We've worked together, it, or we're close friends. Like see, I can vouch for you. Yeah, but for uh, me, like LinkedIn's the opposite. Like LinkedIn is the one social network where if you have a very thin excuse, I'll accept your friendship. Now I do really? have to have heard of you. Oh, but like I, I'm much more picky on Facebook. Like Facebook, you better have like a reference. You know, th- references in yeah. triplicate that are notarized. I mean, with with LinkedIn, it was like the, these people have been like the only f- people we know in common are celebrities, are like Jacksonville <laughs> celebrities. Yeah, and celebrities I actually know, but. They're celebrities, so everybody knows them. Brad Pitt's my friend on LinkedIn. Uh, he, so we're one level away. I can totally be friends with Brad Pitt. Yes. <laughs> That's <laughs> not anyways, actually true, by the no. way. No, okay. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. LinkedIn is like, you know, because it's a professional social network or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm always like, well, I don't really know you, so I can't vouch for you. So Yeah, well, now, now, yeah. now that they have those things where you, uh, speaking of vouching, like you literally – vouch for people's skill sets right right which you is endorse them yeah. yeah you endorse them that's how that's it yeah 
And again, so, I'll do that if I know you and have worked uh, right, with you. Right, you know, right. I'm not going to endorse your skill set if I have never worked but with I you. But I mean, I know the original intention of LinkedIn was supposed to be like, you know, we're sev- we're all seven steps away from each other. So mm-hmm. this is just getting you contact with so-and-so. Like if I wanted to talk to Bill Gates about something, I could find people and find all the pathways to get to know him. Mm-hmm. But you're supposed to talk to somebody who knows that person and say, hey, can you introduce me to this person? Mm-hmm. And... I don't know. These people aren't doing that. Yeah. So I'm not going to accept your request. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. not. I'm trying. Try, email me. Send me an email and we can talk mm-hmm. about it. Maybe then I'll friend you. Yeah. Get to know me. Just like know real me life. as a person. Real life. Before you friend me on LinkedIn. Hey, uh, I think we have an actual voicemail with <laughs> okay. a question from a listener named Felicia. Felicia. Can we get that, Sean? Sweet. Hi, Deemable Tech. My name Hi. is Felicia, and I saw you at One Spark, oh, and yeah. I still have your card. And I'm having problems with the conduit. I have a um, is that like the Matrix? Dell yeah. laptop, and two days ago I started getting conduit kept coming up whenever I browsed on Internet Explorer or Chrome, mm. uh, because I browse on both of them because I'm old and so I do Internet Explorer. Um, what is that? I was I went on it online and I was able to get rid of it sort of in that it doesn't come up anymore but my computer mm-hmm. is like running really slow and so mm-hmm. it makes me think that it's still floating around in there somewhere so how can I get rid of it completely and speed things back up again hmm. thanks a lot and I hope to hear from you soon and good luck can- bye Thanks uh, for your question, Felicia. Can I just be honest? I have no idea what she's talking about. Okay. What is the conduit? Is it like the the Matrix? No, uh, it does have sort of a vaguely sci-fi cult sound, which is exciting. Yeah. But in fact, it's malware. Oh. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Uh, So I did a little bit of research, yeah, and it's actually called Conduit Search, and it's a annoying piece of software that just piggybacks on legitimate downloads and installs itself on your computer. And guess what it does? It gives you a toolbar and also redirects Mm. your search homepage. Um, Mm, That's bad. Yeah. So as you surmise, Felicia, um, there is a conduit search plugin, which you need to uninstall from each of the browsers that has been infected with this program that you did not ask for because uh, it is, you know, it's, it, I'm sure that you didn't agree to install it. I'm sure it, you know, backdoored itself somehow and installed itself. And that's the definition of malware pretty much. Um, so you did the first right thing, but the really annoying thing about conduit search is that actually it's not just a browser plugin. It also installs software and it changes your search provider. So you actually have to fix each of these problems separately. So I'm just going to real quickly walk you through how to do this on Internet Explorer and you can pretty much extrapolate to Chrome. Uh, for Internet Explorer, you would need to open up Internet Explorer, um, and then select tools and then choose the manage add-ons option. Okay. And then there's going to be a new window that will show all your current add-ons and uh, select toolbars and extensions under types and look for the conduit items on the right pan- on the right pane. Um, you cannot delete the toolbar and extensions from this process, but you must disable it here to stop it from work to stop it working. Um, you may jump to tips below to uninstall the conduit software. Uh, one at a time, select conduit and click on disable button to stop service. Okay. So that's step one. Now we need to remove the conduit search provider. So in that same window, click on search providers on the add-on types pane. Um, And again, you can't remove it here, but you can uh, select your desired search engine. So pick Google or Bing or whatever you like um, that you have legitimately installed. Yeah, Bing's getting better. Um, Hey, uh, no judgments. (laughs) You know, whatever whatever search engine you like. Uh, And then you can now highlight the conduit web service and click on remove once it is no longer your default search provider. Um, the last thing you need to do is, like I said, this actually installs software. So you actually need to go to your control panel and go to the list of installed programs, which is usually under programs, depending on what version of Windows you have. And you need to highlight a uh, conduit search and click the uninstall button and get rid of it that, that way. Um, and then, of course, finally, if your home page has been reset, you can just go back to tools in your explorer and go to the general tab and change the address of your homepage URL to be something that you would like to actually show up when you open the browser. Now, you mentioned that this was malware. So yes. could malware removers take care of it? Uh, some uh, hopefully would. Um, one I saw recommended, and I have not tried this, and I'm always a little hesitant to recommend specific malware uh, systems. Sure. Um, but one uh, that supposedly will do it is Spy Hunter. 
Okay. So, and I believe that's a legit. The problem with malware removal software, it's like half the malware removal software is malware. Yeah, that's true. You know? And it's so frustrating. You see ads for malware removers. I'm like, and eh, you just installed you, malware. Yeah, if you search for malware remover on Google, the like top 10 results are probably all malware. Yeah. So it's one of those like dangerous searches. Um, but if you already have a program um, and it hasn't, you know, you should probably hopefully have uh, a malware program. And if yours didn't spot it, then it apparently doesn't spot conduit because not every malware program spots all malware. You know right. What I'm and, and the thing with malware is that it, there, there is a wide spectrum of malware. That's true. Some malware is horrible and mm-hmm. gathers data. I mean, there's and... viruses that are trying to infect and infiltrate and destroy your computer. Right. And then there's annoying search programs. Yeah, where it just changes your settings and you can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. This one, though, it doesn't seem to be too much. Yeah, uh, there's some um, there's some good websites out there that sort of describe the different types of malware. And from what I read on Search Conduit, it's not particularly mal- malicious. Um, it's not like trying to gather your passwords right. and, and do all that. I mean, the most evil thing about it is that it installs itself without you asking. Yeah. And it's changed your settings without you asking. But it's not... Uh, doing anything worse than that as far as anyone can tell so okay. but uh and, and going along with that i'm i'm not 100 percent now un- make sure you uninstall the software and definitely go to the control panel and do that step felicia um that might help the slow down but it doesn't seem like this is a big bad piece of malware so i'm not 100 percent sure that it is the culprit behind the slowdown but the thing is you know if you have one piece of malware installed you might have others that are more serious yeah. so Download a good virus scanner, download a good mal- malware scanner, and run it um, because you just don't know where there's one piece of malware that could be more. That's true. All right. Well, we have another question uh, from Kim. Can you read that one? Sure. Kim K writes, there was a break-in at my neighbor's house last night. If I hadn't seen the cops pull up as I was leaving for work, I wouldn't even have known about it. It made me realize just how few of my neighbors I actually know. Is there a website or some other way I can get to know my neighbors that doesn't require going door-to-door and meeting my neighbors in person? Oh, good question. Thanks, Kim. Uh, well, you know, it, I, I've said this. It's kind of ironic with you know Facebook and Twitter and all these social networks we have. We can know what a random acquaintance from high school had for lunch, mm-hmm. but we still might not even know the names of our nearest neighbors. That's true. Um, but there is something that has come to kind of help with that, and that's a new social network called Nextdoor. It's one word, Nextdoor. Dot com. Um, dot com, yeah. It is a private social network that is just for people who live in your neighborhood. So, to And, and you literally have to be invited by... Mail. Right. There's a couple of different ways. You can actually, you have to verify that you live in your neighborhood. Uh, you can either provide a credit card or debit card to verify your street address, which is what I did because mm-hmm. I joined after you. You joined mm-hmm. back when the only way you could verify your location is to get a postcard. Yeah. They sent you a postcard in the mail it. and you entered a security code. Mm-hmm. And they've been using that for marketing too. They send you the postcard just mm-hmm. directly and then you join. Um, so you either have to do that by mail or with your credit card or debit card. They don't charge you anything. They just verify your address. Or um, if your neighborhood has a lead neighbor or the founding neighbor, they can mm-hmm. verify and they can vouch that you actually live in the neighborhood. Um, or in some areas of the country, in the United States, next door can call your landline telephone. Oh, really? If you're one of those people that still has one. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't work for me. Yeah. Uh, so they can verify your address that way. Um, otherwise, you have to be verified by a lead neighbor uh, in your neighborhood. So they protect it yeah, so that sorry. only people who live there can actually access your social network on Nextdoor. Once I got in, I was able to send postcards to people. Is that yeah. still an option? It, as long as they're – that verifies their physical address right. okay. because you're mailing so it you to So you can them. still do that. Yeah. So now once you've been verified and they've confirmed that you live there and they check your address with the sex offenders list, which I just found out. Really? Yeah. So they don't let the sex offenders join. Now, how perfect that is, of course, you know, it can be tweaked. But once you've been verified, uh, you can sign into the website or the iPhone app to find out, you know, all about the yard sales and the missing puppies and all the fun stuff going on in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And um, in in our neighborhood, Riverside, uh, I've seen folks giving stuff away, uh, you know, having garage sales, posting stuff about Mm -hmm. church events and theater events. And something that I was really interested in was they were talking about the smash and grabs, uh, the car smash and grabs that happened last year. Personally, it happened to me in August or yeah, August of last year. 
or September, September of last year, where our car was smashed. They didn't grab anything because there was nothing in my car, but they just smashed my back window. And when I looked back on the timeline on Nextdoor, I saw that people were talking about the same exact thing happening mm-hmm. on their street a few blocks away. I wish I'd been on Nextdoor back then because I would have known about it. Not Might not have made a difference for my car, but at least I would have known. Yeah. Uh, but So you can uh, – so all that kind of neighborhood, you know, neighborhood stuff that you post. And um, – They've even expanded it now. It's kind of cool. I don't know if you noticed. Um, you can talk and share stuff with folks in n- nearby neighborhoods. Oh, really? So, like, the closest neighborhood to us is Murray Hill. Yeah. So, we can see stuff that's going on in Murray Hill if they share it with Riverside that's Avondale. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Uh, but you can also limit how much information you share with a nearby neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So, they may not know your address, but they you know your name. those punks in Murray Hill <laughs> finding out all about her. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, for us personally, uh, for me, it was nice because my in-laws and my, my parents live in Murray Hill. Mm-hmm. So, I can see what's going on there, about what people post. So, cool. it's kind of fun. Um, so, they do have a an iPhone app. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're working on an Android app, too. So, that's going up as well. So, if listeners want to get started with this. Well... All you have to do is go to nextdoor.com. Um, if your neighborhood is already added to Nextdoor, you'll be able to join it. Uh, and like I said, you just have to verify your address, which it'll walk you through. If your neighborhood isn't in Nextdoor, you can become a founding member and start a community on Nextdoor for your neighborhood. And we actually created a link for our listeners. It's dmbl.co slash Nextdoor. If you go to that link and you create a neighborhood on Nextdoor, Nextdoor will give you a $50 Starbucks gift card. So nice. Very you know, nice. if you don't feel like being the person who starts something cool and mapping out your neighborhood, they're giving you 50 bucks to do it. 50 uh, bucks. 50, 50 Starbucks bucks. Bucks. Gift bucks. card. Bucks. 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 Yeah. So check that out. We'll include a link in our show notes, but it's dmbl.co slash next door. So, you know, if you feel like being social with your neighbors without, you know, being social, uh, check out Nextdoor. <laughs> That'll take care of your problems. And you'll, like you were talking about, Kim, that will let you know what's going on in your neighborhood without having to, you know, actually meet them and yeah. get to know people. In fairness, I've met several of my neighbors that are also on Nextdoor. So. Yeah. And, and I, in fact, I invited uh, a couple of them. So Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and I've invited a few. Uh, actually, some folks we met at OneSpark uh, oh, yeah. have joined because I knew they lived in our neighborhood, so I invited them. Very um, cool. Well, let's take a quick second to thank our sponsor, uh, Audible. Uh, for listeners of the Demobile Tech Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download f- with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Uh, they even have New York best time best bleh, New York Times bestsellers uh, like Inferno by Dan Brown. Uh, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, uh, which is uh, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead. Um, so they got great books on audible.com. If you're not familiar with it, they also have the whisper sync technology, which is really great. If you're listening to a book on audible and you also have it in Kindle, you will stay at the same place as you're switching between the book and the audiobook. It's a really fantastic service. Um, something that's not in audible yet, hopefully it's coming soon. I really hope is William Shakespeare's star Wars. Now, we posted about this on demobile.com later, earlier this week. I um, mean, you got a clip from the, uh, the, the promotion video for that, Sean? The desperate hour is now upon us. Please, I beg thee, sir. Oh, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Thou art mine only hope. True it is that these are not the droids for which thou searchest. Alas, poor stormtrooper. So basically what this is is a retelling of Star Wars in Elizabethan English. <laughs> nice. It's a good one. Here, come thou up. Canst not win, I'll warrant Darth. For if thou strike me down, e'en now, e'en here, I shall more great and powerful become than e'er thou hast imagined possible. <laughs> Remember me, O oh Luke, remember me, and ever shall the Force remain with thee. <laughs> nice. So yeah, that was a, a promotional video for the book. Um, like I said, it's not an Audible yet. Yeah, hopefully it will be coming soon. I can't wait to hear that. Um, I'm actually, I think I'm going to be buying the book on Amazon and getting it there. But uh, oh. 
This is from uh, the same publisher, uh, if you've heard of Jane Austen and Seth Graham Smith's Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. <laughs> uh, they are the, the same publisher. Uh, I forgot their name real quick. It's... Uh, Oh, Quirk Books. Uh, Quirk they books. they okay. take and mash Mash-ups. up these ideas, yeah. uh, either books and an idea or two ideas. Like uh, I think Abraham Lincoln, Vampire oh, yeah. Hunter. I think is it's also, also Seth Graham, though. So yeah, yeah, often. yeah. So um, really fun stuff. Uh, and, and Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is available on audible.com. That would probably be a fun one to hear read out aloud. Yeah, and actually on the <laughs> description it says, Now with ultraviolet zombie mayhem. Oh, man, I'm downloading so. it now. Sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, what was I saying? Oh, so either any of those books, except for Star Wars, uh, but Inferno by Dan Brown, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, or uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is available at audible.com. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash deemable. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash deemable for your free audiobook. You can pick out any of those three or any other audiobook you want to try. So give it a, give it a shot. Check it out. Very cool. All right. Well, we've got another question from Julie. We do. Julie writes, I've been hesitant to use a service like LastPass because if it is hacked, then all of my accounts would be compromised. Ew. I first listened to your segment on radio and then downloaded your podcast. I'm an elementary yes. school instructional tech teacher and I learned a lot. Oh, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. That's fantastic. Um, well, before we dive into this, um, and I know a lot of our listeners are going to be familiar with it, but let's briefly recap what LastPass, Dashlane, what are those? Okay, so Lash, La, Lash Pass, Lash Pass. LastPass <laughs> and Dashlane. LastPass is the one that we've recommended for the longest time. Yeah, we both um, use it, love just it. Just recently found out about Dashlane, actually from uh, David Poe, the, the New York Times writer. Okay. Um, they are both a password management service services. Uh, they both have a website where you can manage your passwords on it mm-hmm. and a uh, plug-in for your browser for cr- Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer. And they both have an app on for iPhone and Android where you can manage your passwords. If you're like any normal person that uses the Internet fairly regularly, you probably have more passwords than you can remember. Mm. Some people write them down. Or you use all the same password or everything, which is bad. That's the worst thing you could possibly Don't do. do. That. No. Because what happens is one of those systems is probably going to have a problem and it's going to get hacked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if they find out your password, even if it's a complicated password, but you use it on every other site, they now have access to every other site that you use. Mm-hmm. So the smartest way is to use a complex password that is hard use. to guess. And you'd use a different password for every single site you use. Yep. That's insane for most humans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I have somewhere around 400 sites that I have to maintain passwords for. Yeah. Because of sure. websites I build and, and stuff at work and all that. So these programs, what they do is they manage that for you so that they enter the password in automatically. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to remember your username and password. It remembers it for you. Now, they, like I said, they remember the dozens and dozens of passwords and logins that people have to use on a daily basis. Both LastPass and Dashlane use AES 256 encryption, which is the same type of encryption that your bank uses to keep your account safe. So okay, if so it works there, good. yeah. And it's basically the top of the line encryption that's available right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, on top of that, Dashlane and LastPass encrypt your information one more time when they use uh, SSL technology to transmit it over the internet. So you're basically taking an encrypt- encrypted information, encrypting it again, and mm-hmm. then transmitting it over the internet. Um, and also, your master password that you use to sign into LastPass and Dashlane is not stored anywhere. So if you lose the password, it's gone. They mm-hmm. can't fix it for you. They can't bring it back. It's gone. That seems like a bad thing, but it's really a great thing because mm-hmm. that means nobody can find the password list and match them to the encrypted documents and make it come back. They must be using a hash. Do you know that if they're using a hash? Yes, they're the using password. salted, salted. Uh, okay. Yes, it's salted. <laughs> it's salted. A hash <laughs> is a really computer science-y term. Um, basically, the idea <laughs> is that you uh, take a string of characters and digits, whatever, and you do some kind of mathematical operation on every single one. Like, right. let's say you added three and then added them all together. Um, and that number that you would get would be some pretty much random looking number, like, let's say 532. And if so, if my name adds up to 532 with this, with this algorithm, 
right. um, then I don't need to store my name as a password anymore. I don't need to store Tom Braun as a password. I just need to store two, 532. And right. every time I enter the name, perform that mathematical operation on it, I should get 532. If they match, boom, it's a match. Right. So they're not storing your password. They're storing this hash. And in theory, there's no really good way to reverse engineer a hash. You can't take random, that 532 yeah. and get back to Tom Braun because it's right. random. Exactly. So, so yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. This is over my head. I love the fact that it's over my head because that means I can't understand how to do this. <laughs> and that means I'm pretty, if I'm pretty smart and I can't understand how to do this, there's not a lot of hackers that can, that can do this either. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, this encryption is so high. It's the highest generally available encryption available right now. If, if, if hackers were able to get into Dashlane and LastPass's servers, which LastPass did have a, an, a server attack uh, mm -hmm. about six months ago, roughly, mm -hmm. and they were able to access the data. And here's what they got: useless data mm -hmm. because there's no password to verify to match it up to, and it would take them many months to several years to decrypt the information that's in the database in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they have one of the most secure servers available. They have tons of firewall protection. Um, and even in this case where LastPass had some hackers get into their database, they were only able to get a tiny bit of user data. Mm -hmm. So they were able to get a tiny bit of useless information. Yeah, encrypted user data that they're yeah. not going to be able to easily crack. Double encrypted. So it was like... Okay, well, good mm -hmm. for you. And, of course, LastPass sent out an email to the affected users, and they have plenty of time to change their passwords before anything would happen. So, mm -hmm. um, yes. It, so, in answer to your question, it is very secure. It is way more secure than trying to remember your passwords, writing your passwords down, or especially using the same password everywhere. Mm -hmm. So It's kind of an issue of trust, fundamentally. All password systems are an issue of trust, and you're, sure. you're trusting... In most cases, people are trusting their memory or they're trusting the pad of paper that they jotted down their password on and taped next to their computer, or they're trusting LastPass, which is a prof professionally run company for this very purpose. Yeah. So you got to trust somebody. Um, you might as well trust the professionals. And LastPass specifically has a pretty good track record. We've actually seen what happens in the event of a breach of their yeah. data. Yep. Um, and they did well. You know, Dashlane... Uh, we haven't seen that with them yet, but presumably if they follow the same sort of uh, standard operating procedures, they'll be safe as well. Yeah, something to think about. I was talking to somebody uh, who is not very comfortable with technology about this, and they said, well, you know, well, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable giving someone my password. Okay, think of it this way. If you use the same password on every account that you use, uh, let's say you go to some random website, mm -hmm. you set up a username, and you use that same password. You're trusting them with that password. Exactly. Because that password accesses your bank account, accesses mm -hmm. your email account, and everything else. So if it's you the use same the same thing. password for Amazon.com, Facebook, and your bank account, you're trusting Amazon.com with your with password. With your bank account. And with your bank account, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, essentially, that's that's what it is. Mm. So You always will trust somebody. Or if you go to some random blog and you set up a username and password there, you're mm -hmm. trusting them. And the thing is, those sites are way more likely to get hacked than LastPass and Dashlane. And if LastPass and Dashlane get hacked, they're going to let you know, whereas random website that you go to that you enter your password, they're not going to bother emailing you because mm -hmm. they don't think you care because there's some little you know, website that doesn't yeah. care. So think about it that way. Also, they have a reputation to uphold. And if they lose that reputation, they'll lose their business. Mm -hmm. Random website, not so much. Yeah, They're like, oh, they didn't have a reputation to begin with to, to uphold. So. And we've something to think about. We've talked before, too, about uh, kind of all the rules for having good passwords. You want it to be long. You want it to be complicated. You don't want to use it more than once. LastPass automates that for you. Like, yep. you can give it settings. So I want, I always want to have a 12-digit uh, password. You can do that. You can say, I always want it to be yeah. random letters and numbers. And, and it just creates them for you. And it just you. generates them for you. It remembers them. And it remembers that each website has a different password. Yep. So you're fulfilling... All the requirements of good password policy and have you ever by had using it, these programs. Yeah, and have you ever had it where you go to a website that says, well, you have to have a capital letter, you have to have a lowercase letter, you have to have a punctuation. When you generate a password with LastPass, you can enter those requirements in, and it'll create a password that matches those. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have to think about it. Yeah. It just creates them. So it 
it, we definitely recommend uh, LastPass mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Dashlane. They're both fantastic services. You can't accidentally tell anyone about your passwords. Like, exactly. Because I have no idea what my LastPass passwords are. I mean, I know the master password. Sure. But like uh, the rest of them are all like 18B6 period and comma seven. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't remember that. LastPass remembers that. Exactly. Now, if you're still hesitant to use something like LastPass or Dashlane, you know, we talked about this in a previous uh, Morning Edition segment. The, the, the easiest way to do it as a human to keep track of your passwords is to do something where you just cr- pick four random words mm-hmm. and completely random that have nothing to do with each other, and you get a really long password. Now, that doesn't work with every website because sometimes you have to have a capitalization or a lowercase. So, but it makes it easier to make random, seemingly random uh, passwords yeah. that are easy to remember uh, and easy to write down. Too. So mm-hmm. that's another way. You, if you don't want, it, you still are, you know, hesitant about doing it. That's another way you can have a different password for every site, but it not be too complicated. Yeah. And but Julie, still, we recommend. Yeah, Julie. Again, too. I would, man. Uh, if you read some of the things I've read, uh, there are password lists out there floating in the hyperverse yep. containing millions of cracked passwords, and they compile them into password dictionaries, and then they write programs that test. You know, when they're trying to crack a new password, they test them against the most commonly used passwords from these yep. lists. So hackers know a lot about the stupid passwords that people that seem, generally that use. don't even seem stupid. Yeah, no. you know, like some um, of them like are not intuitively bad. Some you of know, the, you know, one that's joined the new password list. No, you won't even know this. Trenzalor. Trenzalor. Trenz- that sounds like the most random thing in the world, right? Yeah, because you're not a Doctor Who fan. <laughs> I am not. It is a name Busted. of a location in doc- in the Doctor Who universe. And uh, Doctor Who fans are using Trenzalore as their password like crazy because, oh, mm-hmm. Trenzalore, no one's going to guess that. They're guessing it mm-hmm. because people are using it. Yep. So, yeah. So, definitely use it. Uh, if we can haven't convinced you, let us know what we can do to convince you. Because <laughs> <laughs> it really matters. Um, you got to have a different password for everything you use. Especially, especially for... Your major accounts, like your major social networks, your email addresses especially, mm-hmm. and your banking information yep. because that's the thing that can really mess up your life. Um, and the more complex, the more random they are, the better they are. And something to keep in mind too, which we've never actually talked about, is make sure that you're changing your password on LastPass or Dashlane with some frequency. Mm-hmm. You know, Because if somebody gets access to that, well, they have access to your, account, your Dashlane or LastPass account. That's true. So make sure it's a good password that you can remember. And change it frequently. And then it's long. And it's long, yes. But you only have to have one of these. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Then you only have to remember one password. You have to remember one long password instead of 18. Or 400 like me. Right. Uh, Okay, so we've got another question. If you're ready for it, are you ready for it? I'm ready for it. Hey, is there a phone number people can call to uh, ask us questions? Oh, shame on me. We do. It's uh, (laughs) 1-888-888. 972-9868. Or you can always send us an email at questions at deemable.com. Oh, man. That's, that's a great idea. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Greg writes, uh, I have a laptop that is about 10 years old, and it is completely beyond repair. What can I do with it? Is it okay to just throw it in the trash? No. No. Stop. No. Seriously. If you're listening to this right now, if you've already put it in the trash, stop listening. Go back and bring it inside. Never, ever, ever, ever. Ever ever throw computers or basically any electronics in the trash yeah well first of all going back to computers you need to protect yourself and clear any personal data off that thing before you release it into the wild because yes. you're per- putting a hard drive that theoretically had personal information you know on on the curb side yeah. you shouldn't be doing that but that's what you're talking about here right uh so you need to clean that off and i'm not talking about a simple quick reformatting i mean you need to do such a thorough scrubbing of your data that would take the entire cast of csi to recreate it (laughs) of all the the series too not just csi csi miami csi new york it needs to be a tri episode or tri series episode (laughs) all of them together and maybe even ncis Mm, yes they all have to work on Mm -hmm. it Um, and how you do that and let me explain why when you delete something from your hard drive, you're not really erasing it. A lot of people don't know that. Now, I'm not just talking about when you drop something in the recycle bin and then you go back and you you know delete it from the recycle bin. Empty. empty recycle. Even when your recycle bin is empty, your files are still there. The computer is basically pretending that they're not there, mm-hmm. which works great because then it doesn't have to do any extra work. And it doesn't really matter for most people except when you're getting rid of the hard drive. That's when it matters. Yep. 
to really delete and completely get rid of the evidence of a file that was on your hard drive, you have to write over that file. Actually, you have to write over it several times. Because mm-hmm. uh, even if you write over it once, there's still ways to restore it back to what it was before. And that can be complicated, but there are some programs that will do that for you. If you're, if you're using a, a PC, if it's a Windows PC, um, there's a program called Eraser. Mm-hmm. And also, if you have the program called CCleaner, it stands for Crap Cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> so, CCleaner, there's a setting in there called Drive Wiper, which will wipe your hard drive, and, and it'll actually write over it 7 or 35 times, which is the Department of Defense standard for... 7 or 35? 7 or 35, yeah. One or the other. Okay. You can do 7 or you can do 35. Oh, really? 35 is like really scrubbing yeah, that yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it takes like a long time. Grease. Yeah. It takes a long time to do that. 7 okay. is really good enough, but 35 is the DOD standard. So what if they're tossing out a Mac? There's a... Well, and, and this depends on how old the Mac is. If you got a really old Mac, the only thing I could found, find for really old ones was a program called Permanent Eraser. Mm-hmm. Um, you can always plug it into another computer. Uh, that's one thing you could do. Plug it into another computer and run either the programs for Windows Eraser or Drive Wiper mm-hmm. or the program called Permanent Eraser. There's also, on newer Macs, uh, there's a setting where you can go into to, to um, clear out your securely erase is what it's called uh, and you go into the recycle bin or not the recycle bin it's the trash can in, <laughs> in <laughs> mac um, and go to secure erase and that will do it 7 and 35 it's built in right into mac mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people just don't know about it hmm. um, so if you were to connect your hard drive to another computer and do it that way with like an external hard drive adapter you could do that as well okay um, so if We'll include links to those programs in our show notes. Um, but if you have a hard time doing that, you know, check with a local small business. They can usually securely yeah, raise them your, for your you. your local computer guy can do it. Now, once you've taken care of protecting yourself, you need to protect the environment, right? Yes. Computers are actually loaded with toxic metals and materials that are dangerous to the environment, and they need to be handled appropriately. Some cities and counties have curbside pickup of e-waste, but don't just assume. Don't just toss your computer yeah. in with the regular trash. Check your municipality's website to find out where you can drop off your computer so that it's disposed of properly. Now, here in Jacksonville, we found out that e-waste can be dropped off Tuesday through Saturday at the city's Household Hazardous Waste Facility, and it's located at 2675 Commonwealth Avenue. Now, we talked about this uh B- before the show, what kind of chemicals are there in computers? Uh, woo, it's, it's like a chemistry lab in there, let me tell you. Uh, circuit boards contain cadmium and beryllium, which mm. are carcinogens. Right. Um, they're, the steel inside your computer probably has hexavalent chromium baked into it, which Ooh. is bad for your lungs. And where do we know hexavalent chromium from, right? That, I learned about hexavalent chromium in Aaron Brockovich. That's right. It's what they were using as the lubricant for the gears in some sort of equipment, and it was getting into the water supply, and it gave them all cancer. Yeah. Uh, so you don't it's want that. As, it, as I made it sound <laughs> Good there. Good times. Uh, the LCDs in your PC contain mercury. Yep, I knew that. And, of course, there's plastic parts, obviously, which are not biodegradable. Yeah. And in a laptop, you really have the most toxic component of all, which is the battery. Right. And it contains lead and battery acid and lots of scary things. Right. Now, that is a pretty scary list of chemicals, but yeah. those probably wouldn't cause a threat to a person because... You know, first off, the case shields most of you from direct contact yeah. from any of those chemicals. And all those toxins are found in trace amounts that would not be harmless to a human. Harmful. Harmful, right. Yeah. <laughs> Did I say harmless? You said not be harmless. They yeah. would they be harmless. They probably would be harmless to a human because it's <laughs> such a small amount. Right. But the problem is when everybody tosses their electronics in the landfill, which has been happening over the last couple of decades, mm-hmm. all these toxins build and build and build, and that poses a threat to the environment, it gets into the water supply, and kills us all. And yeah. we die. And we don't want that. That's the end game. Gosh, this <laughs> That's how a we dark die. Place. <laughs> okay, so we don't want that. Uh, as they say, though, one man's toxic trash is another man's treasure. There are companies that will take your old computer and your monitor, and they will take them apart and extract those metals out of them to sell as scrap. So you might be able to make a few bucks out of that old junker, even if it is beyond all hope of repair. Just be careful because not every company is the same. There are several companies that will ship your computer and monitor overseas where they will be melted down to get the chemicals out. And this process is just very dangerous, and it's very unsafe for the workers at the plants where this happened at. Um, So make sure the company that you're dealing with is actually handling your e-waste responsibly. Yeah, because there's basically there's two ways that this can happen. One you actually take the computer apart, you tear the things apart, and it, it's a little bit more manual. It takes a little bit more time. Mm-hmm. You have to actually take off the pieces and unsolder things. That takes some manual work. 
what these companies are doing is they're sending them overseas and in these basically sweatshop environments, they're literally just melting them down hmm. and they're extracting out the metals through different chemical processes. And it's, it's, it's terrible and it's releasing all kinds of toxins into the atmosphere and these workers are inhaling it. So definitely don't want to make sure that make sure that that's not happening. Yeah. Um, you can check with your, your state's EPA uh, and find out if they have authorized these different uh, companies. Also, we are going to be, as as we find companies that are legit and that are doing this correctly, we're going to be adding them to our business directory. So you can go to dmobile.com slash business directory and, uh, or just click on the business directory link on our website. And uh, if you see one in your area, you can contact them and uh, hook it, hook it up. Maybe get a few bucks for your computer, you know, cool. Not much. Well, I believe that's all the questions we have for today. We do have more in the inbox, but they'll have to wait for next episode. Yep, we are. We're working on. We got a bunch lined up. We're going to keep going on. Thanks for all your questions and keep them coming. Uh, We have a call free number. What's that number? That is 1 888 972 9868. Or send us an email at questions at dmble.com. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the show, please Please, subscribe. We love subscriptions. You can sc- subscribe to the show on YouTube. You- YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> that's, the, that's the new website it creates. It's like YouTube and iTunes combined. They m- had a baby. Yeah. Um, you can subscribe on iTunes or on YouTube. Just search for Demobile Tech on iTunes or point your favorite podcast app to dmbl.co slash pod. Or just search YouTube for Demobile Tech. <laughs> Our producer is Sean Birch. I'm Ray Hollister. I'm Tom Braun. And this is Demobile Tech. Thanks for listening and have a great week. 